Okay, back on the Sunday, Sunday Night Rant, gang. Uh, let's just wait for this audience to build up. Second crack at this, first go. We had no sound on Facebook. Mm. Let's get this audience back on. So, uh, hi and sorry about that. Good to see you all. Let's have a look. Gang, can I just... Good sound. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Marie, good sound. Guys, can you hear me on Facebook? Hello, just let me know if you can hear me. Say yes, I can hear you or something like that. We're back. Good to see you, Bryce. Andrew, how you going? From Ray White. Aaron Robertson, good to see you, brother. We're all back. Fantastic. Stephen Ritka, good to see you. Okay, beautiful. All righty. Hey, Jay Lee. Good sound. Thank you, Bernard. Good stuff. All righty. Okay. Hello, John. Insta is good. Everyone's on. Let's get the show on the road. Gang, we are going to do a 20-minute MBA, a portable MBA here today. So if you had a management consultant come in, like McKenzie's or Bain & Co., these people that charge, like we're talking tens of thousands of dollars to take an assignment on, the hourly rate is off the charts. I am going to give you some five or six basic concepts that are in their standard toolkit when they come into an organization. And gang, I'm going to give you that. In addition to that, I'm going to also let you know that over the last three weeks, you probably have noticed certain events. Um, there have been a few national conferences. There's interstate. There has been overseas gigs that I have pulled out. I'm sure people that have come on Sunday Night Rant may have been impacted. And I just wanted to let you know that at the moment, I am facing a personal situation. I have a younger brother, uh, much younger than me, who is uh, extremely ill. And I'm putting my uh, time and energy here. And I'm not prepared to actually be uh, interstate or overseas um, in case of an emergency. So, um, gang, I want you to understand that that's the reason why there have been certain events that have been cancelled, including Real Estate Institute, uh, Bailey's. I'm, by the way, I uh, won't be going to New Zealand. I had to have a real estate gym event, Real Estate Institute of New Zealand, um, um, a Ray White event, um, uh, that LJ Hooker National Conferences. So there's lots of events that have been out. So gang, I just want to let you know that's my energy. And I have to say to you, family, man, family is not, you know, important. Family is everything, guys and girls. Family is everything. So um, that's the story there. Now, let's move on. And by the way, having spent so much time dealing with people in the hospital in the last two to three weeks, doctors pretty much every day, I want to let you know that there are a few things I've learned that real estate agents could learn from doctors. The first one is that doctors can stay detached when they're giving bad news. On the surface, that sounds cold and that sounds like a very bedside, a bad bedside manner. But I will say one of the positives that comes out of that is that you actually have someone telling you what you need to hear, not what you'd like to hear. What you're hearing is professional advice. Now, I want you to understand, and by the way, tag someone, bring them into the conversation. This is going to be good value tonight. I'm letting you know this is going to be strong business nuts and bolts advice that chances are you'd get people that would actually spend thousands of dollars listening to a consultant telling them this stuff. So let me start off with doctors. Hypothetically speaking, do you know what actually happens in the world of real estate every day? You have basically the patient dictating what the medicine is. You have the patient actually giving the prescription because this is what actually happens. A real estate agent walks in to value a house and do a listing presentation because the people want to sell. What actually happens is the real estate agent somewhere along the line lacks leadership because instead of actually advising and making a recommendation to a client that is the right thing for that client, what they do is they sell out. 
They sell out. And what they do is they actually tell the client what the client wants to hear because they're too scared to tell the truth. So it would be a bit like this. It would be a bit like the real estate agent that goes in, knows that the client should spend $6,000 in marketing because we know that in real estate, it's about getting bums on seats and the more bums you have in there, the better. Because we actually know in real estate, there are two things an agent does. Number one, attract people to look at a property, which is marketing. And number two is negotiate with a buyer once they've got a buyer to get top dollar. So what they do is they go in and instead of attracting the most amount of buyers, they think this client doesn't want to spend any money marketing. So what I'll do is I'll actually not recommend marketing. That would be like the doctor. That would be like the doctor that sits there in front of someone who's been diagnosed with very bad cancer and the doctor thinking, hey, look, they're going to get upset if I tell them that they've got to have six months of chemo. And I don't want to upset them. And I don't want to lose them as a, as a client or as a patient. So how about I just say, hey, look, um, chemo um, can be really nasty. So um, what I thought I'd do is I'd actually give you something that's not going to make you vomit. It's not going to make you too sick. You're not going to lose your hair. Um, you're not going to be nauseous. And you're pretty much going to be able to, you know, uh, move on and, and, and get on with your life. And it's called um, XY drug. And it doesn't have a lot of the side effects. And what actually happens is that... Um, you take that recommendation because you don't want to go through all the pain and then six months you're dead, right? No, doctors don't do that. Doctors sit there and basically say to you, this is what you're going to take. This is good for you. This will get the best result. And that is something that we need to learn out of the medical profession that what they do is that they go in as a professional person, and they say to them, this is what you need to do. That is what I mean by real estate's lacking leadership. Gang. All right. So, and by the way, when we're on that topic, listen, I don't like going into too much on a political front, but I'm just going to give you all a bit of information here that's really useful to know, because I personally believe that we need to have a royal inquiry into the Australian private health insurance system and the way hospitals work. And I'll tell you why. Because the minute, the minute you go into a hospital, the first question they're going to ask you is this. Are you privately insured? Why? Because there's a different deal. And I'll tell you how it works. At the hospital that we're involved with, get ready for this. Get ready for this. If you are a private insured patient, they will go off and they will bill your insurance company. And guess what the only difference is between a public patient and a private patient? Get ready for it. The Telegraph newspaper put on your bed each day and free access to a television that was built in 1954 that hangs off the roof that's got this thing that sound comes out of, which is a bit of a joke where you get three or four stations. That's what you get for a private health insurance patient. And I want you, next time you get a product or service from anyone, a dentist, a doctor, massage therapist, a podiatrist, ask the simple question, why are you asking me if I'm a private patient? Why? Because there needs to be an inquiry into the relationship between private health insurance and hospitals and medical providers, because as far as I'm concerned, there is something very deceptive on that whole process. End of rant there. Gang, Let me move on. And by the way, whilst we're on that subject, let me touch on this. Right now, my friends, and I speak from experience, and I don't like having to say this because there'll be a lot of people that are watching this, but medicinal cannabis is long overdue. Long overdue. And I'll tell you why. How on earth 
How on earth can you have medicinal cannabis to be considered as a harder drug than the addictive drugs that are being sold that you can actually get from a pharmacy? Derivatives, derivatives of morphine, oxytocin and what have you. Beyond belief. Can't get over it. I mean, even 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 with I mean, like even alcohol, even alcohol, alcohol will actually cause liver problems. Alcohol is addictive. Alcohol can cause violence. How on earth Australia remains one of the few countries, one of the few countries in the whole world that does not have medicinal cannabis? Available to patients, particularly those in palliative care. Palliative care means symptom management. There's no cure. Beyond belief. Why do I share this story with you? Because I speak to you from experience. And that is, as someone who has had cancer treatment three times in their life. That's correct. Three times in their life. I can say to you that for me to have coped with some of the terrible side effects that are caused by systemic chemotherapy going through your body that include vomiting, nausea, not being able to sleep, and feeling like you've had a hangover for eight months, that I, without any government assistance, because it medicinal cannabis, is not up and running in most parts of Australia for most people, I myself would actually have a puff on a joint for health reasons. Be very, very clear. And what it did is it gave me an appetite. It got rid of vomiting. And I have to say to you that many of you know, many of you know right here, right now, that right through chemo, all times, I pretty much have worked through it. So there's anecdotal evidence where I'm the subject and I'm the scientist, I'm the subject and I'm the scientist, where I have felt that people that are in palliative care should be having access to medicinal cannabis. End of story there. Let's move on. Business, marketing. I want to explain marketing to you very, very briefly. Here is the short version of marketing. Number one, I'm going to give you a story, and it was a story I was reading in a book, which is going to help you understand marketing, because the majority of the people I speak to do not know the difference between marketing, advertising, sales, PR. It's all the same. Let me go through. Marketing. If a circus came into town... Picture a circus coming into town. The elephant, right, hang on. If a circus came into town and there was a drawing put up in the middle of the city that said, circus in town, Saturday night, 7 o'clock. That is an advert. Understand that. Number two, if we got an elephant that walk through the town with a sticker on it. That is called a promo. The next thing is, if the elephant walked in to the public school, that would be called publicity. If the school kids came out and laughed and the principal laughed, And then what happened is the local newspaper wrote a story that the local elephant went into the school and all the kids had a laugh. That would be called a PR stunt. On the night of the circus, so the people go to the circus and they are spending money and they're buying things and they're buying rides and they're buying toys and they're winning stuffed animals and they're spending money. That is called sales. My friend, all that together, the advert, 
the promo, the PR stunt, the sales is called a marketing strategy. You must understand each element is a tactic. The total plan is a strategy. And that's why I think that most people in business don't understand that you need both a strategy and tactics that make up the strategy. That is the simplified version. Guys and girls, let me have a quick drink of water. By the way, this is a guy that has struggled to drink water all his life. And I found this brand, Aqualove, which has got a 9 to 10 pH. And Nick Rigas would be very proud of me because he's constantly saying, stay hydrated. And this water, Aqualove, look at it there, for some reason, tastes beautiful. Now, let me move on and explain to you strategy further. Too many people think a strategy is the thing to do. It's not. Let me explain. If you're going to build a house, think about what actually happens. You get a permit. You speak to council, of course. You have an architect. You then get a builder. You work out how many bricks are going to be needed. You work out where the house will be on the land. You work out where the pool will be. And then, after you've done all of that, you start building. Then you get a kitchen guy. Then you get an electrician guy. Then you get a plumber. The point I'm making is, nothing happens without the strategy in the first place. And I think that most people in business are basically doing a random act of lots of little tactics that do not fit into a strategy. So gang, understand you need both. The biggest mistake I've learned, and, and, and let me tell you, for 13 years of my life, I worked as an executive at News Corporation. Some of the budgets I ran, which I was accountable for, sole responsibility at the end of the year was that number, were budgets of 400 million. As a small business person, I have had budgets that are very, very small, nothing like 400 million. The biggest mistake I see in business is this, that a company copies the marketing plan of a big corporation. This is a failed move. I'll explain to you why. A big corporation does marketing for other reasons, not the same reasons as a small business. When you're an entrepreneur, what you're doing in your venture is this. You are doing one thing, and that is spend marketing to make a profit. When you're a big corporation, your marketing strategy is about this. Pleasing stakeholders. Making sure that other colleagues are aligned. Building the brand. Because brand building is totally different to wanting call of action, which is what most small businesses need. And the last thing is big businesses want a net profit. But small businesses only want a net profit. And that's why I say to you, for a small business, what you've got to do is understand this simple concept. It's called money at a discount. Listen to me very carefully. Money at a discount. What does this mean? I want to ask you this question. If they were selling $10 notes for $2, you would go crazy buying those. If they were selling $10 notes for $2, 
you would go crazy buying $10 notes. That is good marketing. That, my friends, is what you need to be doing. You need to be buying money at a discount. That is what business is all about, which is going to bring me onto another rule that I live by. And that rule is called the 64-4 rule. Everyone knows Pareto's 80-20 rule. And the 80-20 rule says this, that 20% of the stuff you do gives you 80% of the results. However, when you get the 80-20 rule and put it on the 80-20 rule, you end up getting the 64% to the 4% rule, which says that 4% of the stuff you do gives you more than 64% of your results. Gang, I'm saying to you this. Thank you, Nick. What we did with the Herald Sun, absolutely correct. What you need to do is to find your 4%. That is the secret, my friends. You need to find your 4%. Because what we're saying is that 96% of the money you invest in marketing and the stuff you do could be a waste of time. Something unimportant done well does not make that thing important. So, gang, I have to say that what I'd like you to do is to also understand the difference between goals and systems. Now, Emily Jordan, who sent me a very good uh, Insta post on private message before, and by the way, all the real estate gym members, I urge you to go watch the video of Emily Giordano from, uh, from Harcourt's One Turner. What an extraordinary, impressive young girl she is. Under 30 years of age, riding over a million dollars in GCI, came out of working in retail, selling uh, uh, men's suits, I think. And um, getting back to the post she sent me, it said something along the lines of this. Now, I can't remember it word for word, but I'm just going to say that a goal is not to be... Oh, hang on. Let me explain it in a way that most of the people here can understand. A coach, a sports coach, has a goal to win the game. The strategy, my friends, is the practice that they're doing day in, day out. It's the system of practicing. A real estate agent has a goal to write a million dollars. The system is what they're doing prospecting, what they're doing in buyer management, what they're doing in vendor management, what they're doing in social media. It's all those things. So why am I saying this? Don't mix goals with systems. The goal is the achievement. The systems are the things you do to reach your goal. And on that point, I'm going to say this. Be married to the system, not married to the goal. Be married to the process, not married to the outcome. That is what will get you the result. Fall in love with the process. And the proceeds will come, my friends. And on that note, I'm going to leave you. And I'm also getting sick and tired that every time someone in the media gets done with drugs, this time it's Ray Hadley's son, other times it's football players, let me just say this, and I don't know the personal situation of Ray Hadley's son, but what I'll say is, every time someone gets busted, the story is, 
there's a mental health issue and there are problems and they want to, you know, lock into a rehab clinic, all that. Now, gang, I've been hearing this for years. Swimmers, actors, let's call it what it is. When someone gets caught doing drugs, they got busted because they wanted to get high most of the times. They wanted to have a line of coke. They got caught with an ecstasy tablet. And chances are that they probably didn't have a mental health issue. They were just fucking partying animals, fucking partying and partying that got busted. Simple as that. Let's not make it bigger than what it is and you turn around and say that they're going into a rehab clinic, what have you. But gang, I'm going to leave you on this point. As someone at the moment who's going through a time where family is everything, think for a quick moment. Listen to me very carefully. Who is your brother, your relative, your dad, your mum, your sister, your uncle, maybe one of your best mates that for whatever reason, you've just stopped communicating with them, had a bit of a fallout. Whoever it is, let me tell you, never forget this. Great title. Robin Sharma wrote a book. It says, Who will cry when you die? Remember that. God bless.